What is up everybody? Today, we're gonna go over what is hip impingement? What are the causes of it? What are the symptoms you might be feeling? What are the best treatment options? Is surgery right for you? And I'm gonna dive into some details. So you're gonna need to be relatively sober here and listening. And I'll give you a warning whenever you're gonna need to have a little extra focus, okay? Cause you gotta use a couple brain cells to understand this one. I'm gonna guide you through though, all right? <laughs> So let's start with what is hip impingement. So hip impingement is a clinical term that describes an impingement, meaning something that pinches here, here. So what actually is impinging is whenever the ball, pretty much like the neck here of the femur, collides with the top of the socket. Collision, that collision right there is what impingement is. So the moment it strikes, it is impinged. Now, how impingement progresses over time is this. You know, this thing whacks it. This guy's your body's so durable. So when the impingement first strikes, you probably don't even feel anything. It strikes and it strikes and it strikes and it strikes. And I'll explain to you in detail how it strikes and why. And when you understand how to reverse this trifecta, you are literally free. So it strikes, it strikes, it strikes. And what happens though, see this blue? This is actually gum. I chewed it earlier. Okay, that's your labrum. So what happens first is as it strikes, it comes in contact. If you look closely, the actual labrum is what gets pinched first. You see that pinch of the blue? That's your labrum being pinched. Medically, we could say the labral phrase first, okay? And then over time, what happens, because it's not only there, but there's, there's, there's movement because it, it will grind as well. Then the labrum will tear. After the labral tearing, what occurs then is this collision just keeps striking and striking and striking, and it only strikes in a very, very, very specific point of the hip, right here. It's coming from uneven pressure distribution on the hip, okay, hint. So what happens is constant collision after it smashes down through the labrum, it now is essentially striking the bone on the bone, and your body, there's an, there's an amazing mechanism called Wolf's Law. What Wolf's Law states is your body will respond to compression on bone by creating more bone. For example, Let's say you get some big fat guy and he like, he eats well. So he's got all the nutrients. He's gonna have extra bone density because his body goes, hey, I got all this weight on my frame. So it's gonna make the bone. Why women are most prone to osteoporosis, middle-aged woman after menopause as well, right? They're losing muscle mass. They're, they're becoming thin. They can become thin. And so the body goes, I don't need as much bone. So if your nutrition's right, what happens is the body responds the same way with the collision. It goes, I need stability. So it's gonna grow growth spurs off of this thing. Now doctors are gonna call it cam, they're gonna call it pincer, they're gonna eventually call it osteoarthritis. None of those things, it's none of those. Degenerative joints, it's none of those things. It's your body's natural response to your hip colliding in the same exact place over and over instead of doing what it's supposed to do. If the pressure is distributed equally amongst the labrum and the hip, then the entire labrum and the entire hip will degenerate naturally over time. Your hip should last 120 years. That is the progression. And that progression of osteoarthritis, right? And then that usually leads to people choosing, choosing to get a hip replacement eventually, which is not what you want to do. And I'll explain that. So signs and symptoms of hip impingement. Oh, hey, Ty. Hey, what's up? <laughs> signs and symptoms that you have hip impingement. Now, I wanna be clear, first of all, people go, oh, it's my hip flexor pain. Guys, I think hip flexor pain is about 8% of the time. Hip impingement pain is specific pinpoint sharp pain that occurs in the groin right here that is often worsened by, well, here's a test for you to do right now to see if you have hip impingement. Let's show them tie the test. So you're gonna bring your knee to your chest. You hold on to something too. You'll hold on to a wall. Bring your knee to your chest. Go and face the camera here, Ty. I'll hold you, good, I got you. Now bring the, your thigh across your body and now you're gonna rotate your foot outwards, okay? If that right there produces that pinch right here, that's positive for hip impingement. Another common movement that will elicit hip impingement is squat. So we'll go and do a squat all the way down to hip impingement. If you've hit that often, the deeper you go, the more it will create that pinch. And I'll explain to you why. All the stuff's reversible. So that's a test. Also lunging, like a big step forward and lunging down, that can produce that pain. So right now, if you have that sharp pain in there, if that test was positive and it hurts me you squat, things are lining up that your pain is actually hip impingement. Now, signs. If you're one of the few people, you're like, I don't want to get hip impingement. How do I know if I'm prone to it? I am so happy you're here. 
And it's amazing that one of you or two of you are here. I hope one day the whole world will be focusing on if you're moving your body correctly, you're essentially preventing these things from happening. But let's talk about some signs, things you see that could be that increase your chances of you developing or, yeah, increase your chances. It's kind of not really a chance. It's not really a game of chance. It's a game of predictability. It's whether you feel the pain. So number one sign, go and turn your side tight, is the anterior pelvic tilt. Big swooping arch in the back, anterior pelvic tilt. That right there is, and, and by the way, Ty has a hard time going into anterior. He's actually in a lower risk for impingement. The flatter your back is, the lower the risk you are for hip impingement. I'll explain to you why. Okay. The next sign, if you're doing a squat and your knees go inward when you squat, that is another risk factor for hip impingement. It's called valgus collapse. Knees go in. Those are signs. Those are things that you could see. So you got anterior tail, you got these. Now let's explain to you why. Why? 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 This is my favorite part. I love this part. So let's take this hip. This is the right hip. We'll put it here. So on this hip right now, when you have anterior tilt, what you're gonna see happen is, you see how more of the ball becomes covered? Look at how much ball is exposed. There's a lot of ball exposed. When you go into anterior tilt, it starts to cover. It increases the coverage on the ball. The more that the ball is covered, whenever you flex your hip, AKA go down for a squat or bring your knee to your chest, the quicker your neck of your femur approximates and collides. Again, this is very important. When you have anterior pelvic tilt, it covers the ball. And so whenever the femur comes up, it strikes sooner. Now let's take this for example. If this hip was not so anterior and pulled back, look at how much more range the hip has to go up before it collides. So that's number one. This is a trifecta. Hip impingement is a trifecta. That is the, that is the uno facto. Okay? The dose facto is going to be internal rotation of the hip. So now you've got anterior tilt, and then you have internal rotation of the hip. Again, so you got more coverage, and now this part of the neck of the femur is now, this is the tallest part of the neck, so now it's even closer, less room before the collision occurs. And number three, it goes with it, because whenever the femur internally rotates, especially in a squat, the thigh comes across the body and adducts. So when you combine anterior tilt, internal rotation, and adduction of the hip, and then you squat or lunge with that position, that's when the collision occurs. That's biomechanically when the collision occurs. Do you wanna know the short answer? I'll give you the short secret to how to fix it. You have to strengthen and mobilize your body in the opposite direction of the misalignments. You have to strengthen and mobilize your body in the opposite direction of the misalignments. But look, you can't, you don't know how to do that. You, that's why you gotta learn one at a time. You gotta learn first the pelvis, then the hip. You can't do them all together. You don't know how to do it. I'll give you maybe a couple of tips at the end, but you need a plan. I got a plan for you. So that combination occurs, and then you combine that with every time you squat, every time you bend, collision, 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 collision. Your body's so strong, it's trying to fix itself. Your body's trying to lay down new bone. It's trying to absorb old bone. It's trying to repair this but you are outpacing your body's ability to heal by continuing to jam onto the area. You're outpacing it. You're never giving your body a chance to heal because you keep peeling the scab off, jamming the knuckle again. So then the next question becomes, hey, should I consider surgery for this hip impingement? I'm gonna tell you this. I've been in this profession for 24 years. I've worked with over 15,000 patients one-on-one, have millions of people online. I get the amount of thousands of DMs that I get, the 100, 200,000 members we've had in our programs. I don't know anybody who's heard it more than me. And I'll tell you what, and I'll tell you why the research backs this. I have maybe seen a handful of times that somebody was happy with their hip labral tear surgery three to five years later. Only a handful of times. The reason why that it doesn't work is because it doesn't stop the collision. What the surgeons will say is they go, oh, we're gonna go in there. They're gonna say, the labrum's torn through here. You can kind of see it here. There's a tear in the labrum through here. And it makes sense, gonna, we're gonna go sew it. We'll go sew it up there. And what they can do is they can also shave down a little bone so the collision doesn't occur as much. So what they'll do is they'll sew that up. But it does nothing to address the mechanical issue. Zero, nothing, nothing at all. And so the second you're out of surgery, you start squatting again, collision, 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 collision. And the research, there's been a 500% increase in labral repair surgeries over the last, I think, five to 10 years. 
I haven't read this report in a while. The researchers themselves are telling the surgeons, telling the AMA, hey, the research is not supporting these surgeries and they're still doing it. Why? Well, they make a lot of money doing it. They make a lot of money doing a the surgery. They make no money telling you to go to move you and to fix this. They make zero money doing that. If they did that all day, they would just literally be running a charity clinic because they would not be performing surgeries and people would be getting better. Someone comes to the door, they go, go to move you and fix it, and then they leave and never come back. Go to move you and fix it, go to move you and fix it, they have no surgeries. If they, if they can't do surgeries, they don't make money. And if they can't do surgeries, the hospitals don't make money. There's pressure from all levels to do surgeries. So, hip impingement surgery near useless. There ain't no surgery for you, which is great news. That means there's only one thing for you to do, it's fix your shit. How to fix hip impingement, how to fix this hip pain without surgery. As I mentioned, it's a trifecta approach. So number one, you have to create more gap. It, let me show you what that means, okay? We talked about how this collision occurs right here to here. What you need to learn how to do is create space. These two red, look at these red points. Red and red, that's the collision point. So what you need to do is create more space. So by learning how to strengthen and mobilize your hips in a more posterior tilt, AKA activate deep core muscles, deep core, activate them with the intention of moving your hip in a more posterior tilt, strengthen and mobilize yourself this way, it creates distance. You wanna separate these two points, okay? They're like the high school dudes that just fight each other. You're trying to separate them. You wanna create separation between them. You don't want them to go head on collision, okay? Brain injuries, you know, black eyes, impingement. So by one, you wanna strengthen and mobilize your hips in a more posterior tilt through core activation, glute activation, but not by strengthening those with a focus of, of, of the focus is on activating, on, 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 on realigning your pelvis. That's the focal point. Number two, you need to strengthen and mobilize this femur bone to move into more outward rotation. You need to strengthen and mobilize this hip into external rotation. And then strengthen and mobilize it into more external rotation and abduction. That's literally the trifecta. So if you strengthen and mobilize each one of those individual pieces into the opposite direction, you will create space. That hip will heal. That hip will feel better. The impingement will stop. The pressure will now be redistributed more equally amongst the labrum instead of this one pinpoint spot. Whack, 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 okay? More easier pressure distribution. It starts with simple exercises as well. We'll show, let's kind of do a, a couple little tips. I guess if you are still squatting, maybe you're not bad enough to fix it, but just want a couple tips. So you want to focus more on pulling your pelvis into more of a posterior tilt. Right, and you wanna focus on that throughout the day and strengthen yourself into that position too. You also wanna, whenever you're doing squats, let's show them a squat too. Whenever you're, whenever you're squatting and moving up and down, you wanna focus on maximally abducting the hip and outwardly rotating that. And oftentimes people like Ty, you can have different femur lengths and mobility. You see Ty's got a pretty flat back angle, so that position right there could actually impinge him, so you might wanna stay more upright on the squat. Now look, I don't wanna overwhelm you guys on movements because the truth is that those, those movements are complex. I'm so proud to offer you guys a specific program for hip impingement, for labral tears, for CAM, for pincer, for osteoarthritis. Specific program. And what this program is, is it gives you weekly progressive routines. Week one, you're gonna get three to five exercises to do that week. Mind-body connection, uh, and I'll give you specific instructions on how to do them. Not just how many, how to do them. That's week one. Week two builds on week one. Week three builds on week two. So maybe you go four weeks and you go, hey, you know what, I'm feeling pretty good four weeks, I'm gonna go, uh, whatever, cancel my membership in a month. You continue those week four exercises, you will forever be this high off of ground zero. Now, in total, I have 37 progressions. That's nine months. That's phase one, three months, phase two, three months, phase three, three months, okay? Each level of progression that you do is gonna keep you further from the bottom. It's gonna put money in your bank account. You're gonna have a, instead of it being broke, or in debt and negative and pain, you'll build yourself up to flat, you'll build yourself a reservoir of savings and movement, and eventually what happens is that structure becomes, it goes from pain to functioning in a daily life, free from pain, to being able to perform with pain. Mountain biking, golfing, whatever you do, it gives you that freedom. And then afterwards, it just becomes more performance. The sky's the limit for you guys. There's always progress to make. It's never too late to start, never, ever, ever. Never, ever, ever too late to start. And you don't need this hip impingement, you don't need this labrum to be sewed together and healed. Remember, your body has a beautiful mechanism called scar tissue. And when you leave that labrum alone, when you stop colliding it like two freaking goats, just whacking, whack, when you stop doing that, your body lays down these things called fibroblasts, and afterwards, it lays down collagen fibers. And collagen fiber is scar tissue in that webbing. That's 70, 80% as strong as the regular tissue, which is stronger than, than a needle and thread that they would use in there. So your body naturally heals itself but it can not and will not heal itself until you stop the collision from occurring. So that's hip impingement. That's what it is. 
signs and symptoms, how to test for it, the progression of hip impingement, surgeries for hip impingement, and also the overall plan, the big picture plan about how to fix that hip impingement. Now, it's on you. It's on you to do it. The path is laid out. It works every time. It's right there in front of you. The question is, are you gonna do it? Or are you gonna complain about it? Or are you gonna go look for a quick fix for it? Or are you just gonna accept your life as how it is? Man, it's just how I am now. I just can't go do these things anymore. Are you just gonna shrink your world of possibility all the way down and let it keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking? Or are you gonna fight for that freedom to move? I'm always advocating for you guys to fight to expand your possibilities. That can't be you. The sky's the limit. Make your choice. I think you should fix your shit. <laughs>